Hi, I'd like to thank you for all your hard work these last few weeks. Let's do a little recap on what we've been doing and what we've been applying. I need you to be very reflective on and very, very reflective on what you've done and very deliberate in including some of these very important strategies that we know are, are what we call high utility. They're not very hard to use. They're really easy to get into in a system of habit both for instructors and for students and they yield really good results. So if you would uh, allow me the time to go back through those and talk about them a little bit so that when I ask you to get in mind of what you're doing and the reflection this week to be a little bit more comprehensive of from first week until now. What I will do with that is I will respond to you individually about what I think I hear you saying and about any ways that I can see that you might make this more impactful for your students. We talked about introducing each new read that you give students, whether it's a new book, whether it is something that's online, whatever it is, handout, whatever it might be, there is a, there is a procedure to go through to ensure that you have introduced that book at the level that it needs to be so that students look forward to the journey so that they feel engaged with it. The next step would be to make sure that you've built background for students and that you've activated whatever schema they have. This is not a perfunctory, how many of you have ever so-and-so? It might start that way, but what you need to do is get a feel around the room. How do you know when you've done enough on that? you get a feel from around the room from students making eye, ca eye contact, from their nods, from their engagement, whatever it might be. And if you want to be a little bit more concrete with that, start it out with a free write. For the next 30 seconds, I want you to write everything that you know related to whatever. Sometimes I do that with a George Washington piece that I do with people because much of what people think they know about George Washington is actually not true. And our history books are a bit askew in what they uh, promote about George Washington, especially what we remember from our elementary days and, and learning about the presidents. So you can be rather surface if it's something you think most people in your room in your classroom are going to know and have a good engagement with maybe not so much activating schema but with most everything else it's just as serious a part of getting students to read it as anything you can do from there we talked about um, different types of metacognitive journals that you might be asking students to keep if you're not going to do a reading guide some sort of very general type of journal is your next best bet. Something that is a generic prompt. Folks, as you read this, I want your journal to reflect your initial thoughts, your thoughts uh, related to the author's purpose, da 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 da. So you, you give them a little overview with that each time. So if you are going to do uh, reading guides and, and truly, I am promoting those as one of the most impactful things that you can do to engage students in the reading and actually get them to read. One measure of impact of what you're doing this summer, excuse me, doing this semester with your students is the impact of how their reading will improve just from having read with no specific strategy necessarily in place if those habits don't develop on their own at least you've got the understanding and the knowing that students have gotten better at reading just because they've actually been reading instead of trying to attempt your um, different types of assignments and, and experiences in relating to reading by guessing it by taking some sort of shortcut, by googling some of the topics, whatever it might be, uh, they will exhaust themselves in doing almost anything but actually reading what you ask them to read. So the whole section on reading guides, I've only heard a little bit back from you on that. I know it takes a while to develop them. What I would really hope is that every other week, every other reading, once a month from here on out, 
that you would employ what you feel like is a really good strong reading guide and look at what happens in your class based on students reaction to print their involvement with print their involvement with the oral exercises that you have in doing them doing class and um, then on on to a new topic and that new topic would be vocabulary and I want to talk to you a little bit about that in some research that we did with Warren County and Bowling Green City Schools uh, two years ago now we tested all of the seniors who rising juniors these were juniors who were going to be seniors in the fall and and found that their vocabularies were actually um, they scored much lower in those in vocabulary than they did in reading comprehension now the two were very uh, definitely tied together. As few as 5% of words on a page, students don't know that, then they are going to have trouble understanding what, what it says. In the content areas, in biology and chemistry and physics and uh, to some extent even history, there is a set of vocabulary that is very important for the learning. So it's, very, it's quite easy for instructors and easy for students to isolate content vocabulary and for students to learn that. They learn it at a level to be able to feed it back. They learn it at a level to be able to perhaps understand the questions that are being asked them within the discipline. But vocabulary is actually just two things. Vocabulary is depth of word knowledge and vocabulary is repetition. I believe that the challenge that falls within your discipline for vocabulary leans more toward an academic vocabulary. And we know that uh, in many high schools across the country now, they're focusing very heavily on teaching academic vocabulary. This is also called the vocabulary of learning. It, these are the words and the terms and the concepts that we put forward in trying to teach someone something, in trying to explain something, and in trying to ask questions. Many times our students do not know some of those very basic types of academic content words. You need to address vocabulary in some way. Let me give you a couple of alternatives to direct vocabulary. You may be thinking, well, I need to pull out the words. I need to give the students a list of words. I need to have students have a vocabulary journal or in some other way record the definitions of those words. It's not that any of that in itself is not a good practice or a good exercise, but it's not the way people learn words. People learn words in context. So if you want your, your students to learn the words in context, what are some of the things you can do? First of all, you've probably gotten very good at knowing the vocabulary that your students use and the, the vocabulary they're comfortable with. So you could probably with quite a, a degree of accuracy determine which words within a particular piece, within a particular writing that you're asking students to read. Identify the words that are going to give them the most difficulty. So then what do you do with them? If I tell you that giving them the word list method and the definition method is not a very good use of their time or your time you're going to say, well, what else can I do? One thing that you can do is incorporate vocabulary learning into building the background and activating the schema. Deliberately use those words in context so that students can hear how the word is used, can get the meaning of the word through the context of the way you're saying it. It's much easier to do it from context orally than it is from context written. Although it's certainly possible to do from context written, you and I do it all the time. Very literate people learn the, the meaning of words, meanings of words in context by the way it's used. Because our language is such a blend of multiple meaning words, context is our best friend. It doesn't mean that we're supposed to skip over words we don't know or never use a dictionary. It, it means that as many times as we can, figuring out the word in context is probably, with our brain-friendly way of, of dealing with print, probably the best way to learn it. So, number one, 
Look at those passages before you assign them. Identify words that you believe might be problematic for your students. And then deliberately use those words as you are describing and as you are setting the, the context for this reading, as you are building background. That's one way. Another way, incorporate them in the reading guide. Make sure that, that you are putting questions in that incorporate those words so that students are given multiple exposures, multiple experiences with it. And then the third is to ask students to take a section of those words after reading and write a paragraph, write a response to you that uses those words in it so that the words are being used in the proper way. That could also be a formative assessment. Either way, any of those three means will prompt your students to be about the business of growing their vocabularies because ultimately it is their responsibility. But we know that they don't have the skills in place to know what to do with words they don't know, how to approach those. You're the expert in that field. I look forward to following you up with an email with this and to talking to you later. Thanks a lot. You're all doing great work.